Pastor Steve is not a stranger to us, and we, we welcome him to the pulpit this morning. I want to start simply by saying a word of thanks. For those of you who don't know me, I grew up in Worthington starting in grade eight. And people from this church like Tom Henson and Larry Jacobs and John Ardell and others were my brothers in faith. And I remember deep conversations of faith all the way through high school. And later it was John that introduced me to my wife, who was a roommate of Carol's at the time, and they have been a blessing throughout our lives. This church has also been a blessing. I talk of you often. The way that this church has blended two cultures and is growing deeper in their union and their affection for each other is a good news story. I thank God for that. I thank God for the fact that you look beyond your own immediate neighborhood out into the world. Fox is right here. They will touch lives. When I see the church alive and caring about others, That is when I give thanks. On Monday of this week, my wife and I loaded up a van with wheelchairs and walkers and crutches. And this end of the week, they were being loaded into a shipping container where they're going to be going to Liberia, this shipment. It's called Global Health Ministries. And we collect supplies from hospitals like Mayo and Abbott Northwestern and HCMC and all sorts of hospitals around. And then we have a database where hospitals in Africa can just say, well, we need an x-ray machine. We need a sonogram. We need a gross of scalpels. We're kind of like a warehouse for them. They send the order in. And packing day is a day of great joy. It's a day when we're just filling every conceivable thing you can imagine into a shipping container. Packed to the gills. And that's because we say we care about people we don't even know. We care about people we will never see. So it's both and. We care about the people right in front of us, our brothers and sisters in Christ, our community, but we also care about the world. This church is a large part of why I'm a pastor. My faith was nurtured here. I went to Bethel Seminary not to become a, bas a pastor, but to become a marriage and family counselor. And they were the ones that said, you really should think about becoming a pastor. <laughs> and so the story continues. I want to commend you for that. My background in the church going out from here was redeveloping a church that had gotten to a point where they had 12 people left. By the work of God's spirit, that church is still going today. And when that was probably the greatest joy I had in my ministry was just hitting the ground, knocking on doors. Um, it was a blessing. Today, I, want to, I just want to say thanks because that's, the Spirit was moving me before the Spirit service saying, you need to hear a word of thanks of how deeply you are appreciated. Not just for your work for people you don't see, but for people who know you and give thanks for you. I want to start by reading a couple verses today. Actually, it's more than a couple verses. It's a couple readings. And you'll see where this is going in a couple minutes. The first is from James 3, 13 to 18. Oh, well, I'm going to read a little bit further than that. Anyhow, who is wise and knowledgeable among you? 
show by your good works, show, show by your good life that your works are done with gentleness, born of wisdom. But if you have bitter envy and selfish ambition in your hearts, do not be arrogant and lie about the truth. This is not the wisdom that comes down from above, but is earthly, unspiritual and selfish, devilish. For where there is envy and selfish ambition, there will also be disorder and wickedness of every kind. But wisdom from above is first pure, then peaceful, gentle, willing to yield, full of mercy and good fruits, without a trace of partiality or hypocrisy. And the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. A second reading from Mark, chapter 9. I'm going to just go a few verses earlier to give you some background. Then Jesus and the disciples left that place and passed through Galilee, and Jesus did not want anyone to know where they were going, where they were, because he is teaching the disciples. He said to them, The Son of Man is going to be betrayed into the hands of men, and they will kill him. And after three days, he will rise. But they did not understand what he meant and were afraid to ask him about it. They came to Capernaum. When he was in the house, he asked them, What were you arguing about on the road? <laughs> but they kept quiet because on the way they had argued about who was the greatest. Sitting down, Jesus called to the twelve and said, If anyone wants to be first, he must be the very last and the servant of all. He took a little child and had him stand among them. And taking him in his arms, he said to them, Whoever welcomes one of these little children in my name welcomes me. And whoever welcomes me, whoever welcomes me, and whoever does not welcome me, but the one who sent me. The Gospel of the Lord. Grace and peace to you from our Lord and our Savior Jesus the Christ. Amen. You know, I love the American ideal. I believe we all have a responsibility to get involved because democracy is not a spectator sport. Yet there is one thing I really don't like. It's that run-up to elections. This year's elections seem to bring out the worst in people. More attention was given to attacking the opposition than to addressing the real issues, and that's just not right. That sort of stuff drives me nuts. But at the same time, I understand it. There are very few people who have a stomach for the rough and tumble world of politics, and that includes every kind of politics. Politics in schools, politics in government, politics in the workplace, even politics in church. So when we see a nasty fight brewing, the tendency of most people is to duck and run. Most want to, don't want to have any part of it. What they do want is for people to stay focused on the issues and to get the job done. Staying on focus, that is what we're supposed to be doing. And that's exactly what Jesus was talking about in our gospel lesson for today. It's also what James was talking about in our epistle lesson. In the gospel, Jesus had just told the disciples for the second time that he's going to Jerusalem to suffer and to die and to rise again but they still didn't get it. And they were afraid to ask. 
So what did they do? They did the same thing we all tend to do when we are afraid or don't want to deal with a real issue. They started fighting about something else, like who's number one? Now, can you imagine how that made Jesus feel? He had just told them he was going to Jerusalem and he was going to suffer and be crucified, die, and buried. And here they're about number one position. And he wasn't even in the grave. Now, I don't know about you, but if I were Jesus, it would have made me mad. I just poured out my heart saying, I'm going to be facing suffering. And you're all worried about who's number one? But is that how Jesus handled it? No. He didn't tear into them. Instead of playing into their game of church politics and who's number one, he focused on what being his follower is really all about. It's not about power. It's about service. It's not about being one of the in people. It's about bringing other people in, especially those who are stuck on the outside, like the child he took into his arms. Now, unlike today, in those days, children had no rights. In fact, in those days, the rule was children were to be seen and not heard. Fathom. Because we've gone so far the other way these days. Yet one thing has not changed. There are still those who are stuck on the outside. When it comes to life. When it comes to church life. Usually not the children. Children are welcomed with open arms. But rather it's adults who don't quite fit in our particular mold. That's not something we like to talk about. And yet we know it as a fact. A sin we need to confess. I remember one Sunday in Cornwall this couple came in dressed in black leather, head to toe. And they sat down in the pew and people were saying, you know what I mean? They made a judgment about these people saying, they're not one of us. But then after service, we see that they're motorcycle riders. <laughs> and they're just being smart. I told my kid, if you ever get on a motorcycle, you wear your leathers. Sometimes we judge people not knowing what's going on. Anyhow, instead of worrying about number one, getting back to those disciples, and they were all worried about who's going to be calling the shots, like the disciples, the challenge for us remains the same. If we want to be number one with Christ, the way to do it is to be servant of all and reach, all, reach out to all in Christ's name. You know, when Helping Hands was established in Worthington, that's what it was about, right? Reaching out to people, being there for them in the tough times, maybe when they're facing an unplanned pregnancy. That is one of the things that we do with when we look around us and really start to care. If we want to be number one with Christ, the way to do it is to become the servant of all and to reach out to all in Christ's name. That's what the church is about, but that's not where the church was. In like the disciples, that church had fallen into the trap about bickering about things important. Envy and conflict and disputes had taken over the agenda. And those disputes were ripping the church apart. 
That was clearly not of God. What was of God, James reminded them, the wisdom that comes from above is first pure, then peaceful, gentle, willing to yield, full of mercy, good fruits, with no trace of partiality. These are the traits of peacemakers. And frankly, when it comes to politics and church or anywhere else, we need peacemakers far more than we need partisans. We need people who are more concerned about the issues and getting things done than we need people whose biggest concern is who's number one and who will be the greatest among us. Yet can we make that work? As I've looked at this election, it was so close, and we were so divided. And I said, God, can you bring us back together? God, can you help us become one again? And I remembered a story. Back in 1868, the South was struggling back from the American Civil War. And some in the North still wanted to see the South suffer. Even so, a guy by the name of Gil Bates, not Bill Gates, but Gil Bates, made a bet with some other Yankees that he could walk to the South carrying an American flag, following the route that Sherman took to the sea with no weapons, no money, living only on Southern hospitality and finish by Independence Day unharmed. Truth is that Bates' friends thought he was nuts. And while Bates expected a quiet walk through the countryside, his friends expected he would end up dead. Still, the Union sergeant started out in Vicksburg where a major threw a party and Bates received, among other embarrassing gifts, a new silk flag to replace the regimental flag he carried and off he went. And you know what happened? Now, this is a soldier from the army that had defeated them following the path of Sherman's scorched earth march to the sea. What happened? He is welcomed everywhere. Trains stopped for him. When it snowed, a man gave him his overcoat. Mobs of well-wishers caught up to him in the middle of the night. Once he was deterred to see a dying rebel captain. And once when a wood chopper wanted him to pray over his brother's grave. When entering South Carolina, though he is met by 25 Confederate soldiers, veterans gathered, but gathered not for war, but to welcome and protect him because the neighbor, uh, newspaper's editorial had called for violence against him. But that was the only opposition he met for his whole journey. And those, Union so those Confederate soldiers marched alongside him. Finally, on April 14th, he arrived back in D.C., where in the midst of a rainstorm, he is met by cheers, brass bands, and President Johnson, who at the time was being impeached. What for? Trying to reconcile a country that had been torn by a civil war. 
Sergeant Gil Bates brought only faith in America, friendship, forgiveness, and a flag. And the only harm that came to him were sore arms and hands because they had been shaken by so many and so heartily. I think today we need more people like Gil Bates who believe in America, in friendship, and forgiveness. We need more people like James who aspire for heavenly wisdom. First, that is pure, then peaceful, gentle, willing to yield, full of mercy and good fruits with no trace of partiality or hypocrisy. For these are the people who are true followers of Christ. These are the peacemakers. Remember what our Lord Jesus said about peacemakers. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall inherit the earth. So may we be counted among them. How old is this church? 151 years. That's what we've been doing for 151 years. And I pray, God, that we will keep doing it until the Lord Jesus comes again, whether that's next week or in another 150 years. That doesn't matter. What matters is this is a time that the Lord has given us. This is a time when we are called to be peacemakers. This is a time when friendships that were torn apart by, by politics or God forgive us, even family by, torn apart by politics, are called to forgive each other, to reconcile, to seek peace, and to move on. May we be a people, a church that's more interested in living a life of a servant, like our Lord Jesus, than the applause of man and the accolades of others. May the applause of heaven be our greatest joy and greatest goal as we seek to follow him. Amen. I wonder if we could stand together and pray. Lord, I thank you for this church, for the uncountable good deeds that they have done, the ministry of compassion, caring, service, over 151 years. I thank this God for this community, which is being held up as an example in so many places. for a ministry of inclusion, of caring for people. Lord, I want to thank you for the farmers who labor among us. For some, that was a great year. For others, it was a tough year. But this coming year, we pray for sun and rain and a bountiful harvest to feed a hungry world. Lord, I think about Spencer and Maggie today just two weeks in their marriage. And I pray that you bless them with decades yet to come. I pray for all marriages and all young couples starting out, that they might become so richly blessed in their lives together. We pray for our nation that we might recover from the divisions we have suffered during this past election cycle. Get us back together to the point where we are able to focus on the main things and to be a light to the world. 
And now as we draw near to the end of this service, as we look forward to Veterans Day services tomorrow, Heavenly Father, as our nation pauses to remember those in the military now serving, those who have served in the past to protect the freedoms we enjoy, we pray that you would have us all look to you for strength and comfort and guidance. Be with all who serve in the armed forces now. Bless them and their families. Grant your loving protection. Let peace prevail among the nations, O oh God. And where war does rage, we pray that your Holy Spirit raise up peacemakers. Especially let your mercy rest upon our land, even as we acknowledge with thanksgiving your past goodness on this country. We are so richly blessed. If it is your will, preserve the lives of men and women in uniform as they defend our citizenry. We ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. And now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord look upon you with favor and grant you peace. Amen. <laughs>